Well, uh, all the young in age are dismissed. There's a room right there if, there if you want. If you want to stay here, that's fine too. If you need to get a coffee, you're not going to be pointed out by me. If you need to take a bathroom break, that's great. Oh, my. Tell you what, my youngest thinks I'm hilarious. <laughs> Oh, the timing of some things, right? <laughs> so it's funny because this morning I did have a desire to talk about something. And what it was, I thought, well, I want to carry on with Acts chapter 10, and there's something that Peter does here that I want to get into. But there was something missing, and I had no idea what it was, and I heard this other teaching on this podcast I was listening to with my cousins at our men's group on Monday night. And I thought, well, that, that's kind of interesting, and it really hit me too, and... Then the Lord said, well, what, what am I going to do? Like, I don't I, I want to regurgitate something I just heard, but I want to go with this, so what am I going to do? And he said, both. So I said, okay, you got you to figure it out. There's a lot of editing because I didn't see a connection. But as always, he connected these points that just completely astounded me, and they really spoke to me in my life, and I hope they speak to you too. But before we get into that, here's the question that leads to the problem, that leads to the discussion is, does anyone else ever ask the question of yourselves, why does Jesus choose us to do his work? Because that terrifies me. Here's Jesus, and you read, and, you know, especially when you read the New Testament, you read the Gospels, and there's Jesus doing all this good work to people without exception, without condemnation, without, you know, just you're in this category. Everyone was just people that he loved and cared for. He was able to see past cultural barriers. Religiously instituted barriers, racial barriers, hatred barriers. There was no barriers with Christ. And he says, okay, I've lived a good life. I lived life for you. I died the death you deserved to die. I rose again. I gave you the opportunity to have a life you never would have been able to do on your own. I've imparted you with the same spirit that empowered me to do all these good works. And now I expect you to not only continue the work I was doing, but greater things than these you will be a part of. Now go and change the world. And to me, I'm sitting there and I'm evacuating my bowels in terror because I'm thinking, do you know who I am? Because here's the problem. Jesus says, go and do a good work, which only I can do in the first place. But here's the problem. If we try and do it on our own, we can't because we suck. Everyone in this room, if we're going to be honest, there's a point in our lives where we are not very pleased with our own thoughts, speech, behavior, because we suck. <laughs> so maybe that is the title of this morning's service. Is we suck. But here's the thing. You can't spell success without sucks. So there's... <laughs> My uncle liked that one. But here's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> here's the thing, though. At the beginning of time, right, as everything's created, it says that we are created in his image, his likeness, that we were made like God, that we actually bear his image, his likeness. We show everyone else who he is. Have you ever looked at my kids? They look like me. Bex is certainly my daughter, especially in the way she speaks, her facial expressions now. She is my kid. You look at her, you see me. When people look at us, they see God. Because we are creating his image, his legacy. It's a very similar thing, but somewhere along the line, the way that Satan got in and he tempted us, he tried to ruin that image. Why? Because it wasn't about us. It was about, I want to hurt the one who loves you so much. If I can take your kid, if someone's to take my kid and turn them against me, it would crush me. If I can tarnish that image, that likeness, and make you look nothing like the one you ought to look like and be like and sound like and represent, then I've won. And then all of a sudden we get Jesus. He loves, he restores, and takes over everything that we are. Not in some Roman way, which the Jews would have understood, of we're going to dominate and own you and you have to do things our way. It's a liberating, freeing from captivity way. And he loves us because we were always his. So here's the thing. Yes, our human nature even now is still at odds with a saved, restored spirit. And we're not always going to be perfect or think perfectly or do the right thing. But the reason Jesus chooses us, chose us, will continue to choose us to do his work is because he loves us. Because whether we know it or not, we are always his. 
And good parents never give up on their kids. They always pursue them and love them. And thankfully, we have a good, good father who's always pursuing and loving us. And there's always grace extended, and it's never limited. And thank Christ for that, because I would have emptied my reserve tank ten times over. But he says, no, I'll give you more. Not because you deserve it, Aaron, because you don't, but I love you. And that's why. Let me go into a little story here that I never really paid too much attention to because it really never made that much sense to me. And it's a part of the parables of the sowing of the seed that Jesus is sharing. But I only want to focus on one before I get into Acts chapter 10 because it really sets a groundwork for us now and them then. Okay? It says, he told another story. God's kingdom is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. That night, while all his hired men were asleep, his enemies sowed thistles all throughout the wheat and slipped away before dawn. So before we carry on, I've bolded two words at the beginning, good seed. Who planted it? God. God alone plants good seed. And what I mean by good, I mean perfect. I mean without blemish. Only God alone does good and perfect works, okay? We even sing songs. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Remember that song? What was that, from the 90s? Early 2000s? Great tune. But only God alone does good seed. Okay? But throughout the time, his enemy came in and sowed thistles throughout the wheat. So the wheat is actually the good seed. These thistles are going to try and contaminate and taint, just like they did at the beginning of time, the image of what they should be. When the first green shoots appeared and the grain began to form, the thistles showed up too. And the farmhands came to the farmer who sowed the good seed in the first place and said, Master, was that clean seed you planted? Where did these thistles come from? And he answered, Some enemy did this. The farmhand asked, Should we weed out the thistles? He said, No, if you weed out the thistles, you'll pull up the wheat too. Now listen to this. They're asking a question, Should we? He says, No, if you, this is going to end badly. But here's the thing. A lot of times in church, we are the farmhands trying to do good things which we cannot do on our own. Even if it's the right motivation, we try and clean up each other's life and pull out the thistles when God says, No. Because if you do that, you're going to pull out all the good that I've done too. But sometimes in life, we like to beat ourselves up because we bought into this counter-Christ culture that's even in the church where it says, if you come, you need to have your life cleaned out and be fulfilled and be completely pure for the rest of your life. You can't. Why? Because the enemy came in and sold thistles along with his good seed. That's why there's a need for grace. So first of all, cut yourself some slack. Second of all, cut other people some slack. And stop trying to play God in their life. Because again, even if it's with good intentions, you see something that's so broken and obviously wrong, you're like, I just want to... God says, no. Because if you do, you'll pull up the wheat too. I've read this so many times, but it never stood out to me that he's talking about stop putting yourself in my role in somebody else's life, even if you're doing it with the right motivations and love. Now, he's not saying don't, you know, because it's so easy to take a black and white stance. He's not saying don't confront somebody, but your motivation better be right. If it's more about you pointing out something wrong in someone else's life, that's between you and God, and you're responsible for those choices. But you know, that's another sermon. But what he's saying is don't try and play God or be God in someone else's life. And listen to this. This is something you never hear from the pulpit. I never have. Let them grow together. Let the good and the bad in someone's life grow together. Why? Because God is so good, he doesn't work on our timetable. We think we need to see instant results now. And we actually try, and going back a little bit, if we're trying to pull up those thistles, we want to do more of behavior modification than the character reformation that Christ does. Jesus is more concerned with who we are not what we do. What we do is a result of who we are. He wants to go deeper than the surface thing of seeing actions in people's lives. Jesus, don't, let, never mind the thistles. Let them grow together. When? Until harvest time, which is his time. Which means then I'm going to do that work that you could never do perfectly in the first place. You're going to do more damage. Because here's the thing. If a, someone comes in your life and they end up pulling those thistles out and they pull out the good seed, what are you left with? An empty field. Do you ever see people left empty, plucked, naked, and dead? 
by people in the church who are just trying to do a good work. But the one who planted the good seed in the first place says, no, you're going to do more damage than good even though you want to do it for the right reasons. Let me do it in my time, my way. Because nobody here's story is exactly like anyone else's in this room of how Jesus came into your life, reached out to you, you experienced him, and then walked a journey with him. We have the ability to walk together communally, but no one's journey is alike. So why are we trying to do a cookie-cutter same shape formation of this is how it's going to work for you i'm going to enforce my will upon you and let's just hope jesus is behind it all no let them grow together until harvest time then i'll instruct the harvesters to pull up the thistles tie them into bundles to for the fire then gather the wheat and put it in the barn i will separate what is evil what is nasty i'm going to cut it off and i'm going to gather you and put you in the place that you long to be but it's only the farm, the farmer himself, who can do it the way it ought to be. Follow with me so far? And here it is. Now I want to tell you a little story about Acts chapter 10. And Peter is just followed up after Paul's conversion. And he's doing all these miracles in these places he never thought he'd be. And then all of a sudden, there's a man who's brought up in Acts chapter 10 named Cornelius. It doesn't sound like a very good Jewish name because it's not. And this is how the scriptures define who he was as a character. And so we have some background information of who this man is. Cornelius, a Roman centurion and a member of the unit called the Italian cohort. This is not a guy who would have walked with Jesus. So what is he doing here? Well, let's carry on. He lived in Caesarea. Cornelius was an outsider. This is someone that the Jews in the church of the day would have called not of one of us. He was known as an outsider. But it wasn't quite as black and white as that because they tried to operate in that way. It's us and them. But there's something more that's happening in this man's life that makes it a little bit more gray and starts challenging the limitations and beliefs even of the early church. But he was a devout man of God, a God-fearing fellow with a God-fearing family. This man loved the God of the Jews, and he lived life in a way that he would have even acted as a Jew, even though he was certainly not a Jew. So you've got this complex thing that people probably would have tried to ignore because he's kind of in, he's kind of out, he's not one of us, he's an outsider, but he's living like us. What the heck do we do with this guy? He consistently and generously gave to the poor, again, not out of obligation, but he had something at work in his character saying, I want you to be more than you are. But he didn't understand what the name was. He didn't understand where this power came from. He practiced constant prayer to God, and now he's going to have his prayers answered because all of a sudden he has a vision. There's an angel standing next to him. He says, go to this place, this house, and this town. Ask for Peter, also called Simon. Tell him to come to you to tell you about me. Why? Again, I was wondering because why doesn't God, who's absolutely showing up in this moment, having a conversation with this guy who wants nothing more than to connect with God, use someone else to do his work? Because there's so much more to the story and the work of God than just simply doing it himself. Why does he get this man to go look for someone else to come to him and explain it? Because there was a work that needed to be done in Cornelius' life, obviously, but also Peter's that wouldn't have gotten done unless this encounter happened. Fast forward to Peter. It's lunchtime. He's hungry. They're finally starting to make some lunch. The scripture says that it's lunchtime. He's hungry. And then he sees a vision. I love that God uses even the simple, stupid things in life to get our attention, be life-changing. And all of a sudden he sees a vision of this gigantic blanket. And there's a rope at each of the four corners and it lowers down in front of him. And there's all these wild animals running on all four legs. And he hears a voice, the voice of God, as it speaks to him. It says, kill and eat. Because you're hungry. Do it. And Peter rebukes this in the name of Jesus against Jesus. says, no, no way. And I'm reading from a different translation called The Voice because it becomes a bit more dramatic. And this is what Peter says to God, rebuking God in the name of God. No way, Lord. These animals are forbidden in the dietary laws of the Hebrew Scriptures. I've ever eaten non-kosher foods like this before, not once in my life. Now, I want to stop there because here's the thing. 
Now we see a thistle in the life of Peter, and I didn't acknowledge or even see it until I had done this research so far. Peter's response to God, even though God is speaking to him, is no way, Lord. This is against the law. See, the law that he grew up with was so contrary to this grace teaching and the movement of the Spirit of Jesus Christ that Jesus' love and acceptance of all people and the way that he touched and embraced people's lives got him killed by the people who were enforcing the law in the first place. But this was also the cultural and personal influence of Peter who was now arguing against God from his background and his past. Here's a thistle. Peter's all about doing the good work, though. Don't get me wrong. He's seen some impressive important, imaginable things. He's been a part of these healings. He just, well, last week we talked about him being a part of raising the dead because Christ was in him doing a good work. But now we see that Jesus' work doesn't stop just because we're a part of a good mission. He's constantly refining the way we see things, who we are, how we think and speak and operate. Peter responds with the law even though he's all about grace, but it's so deep down he doesn't even recognize it. He thinks he's talking about food, but it's more than that. Listen to this. And it says, a voice, which is the voice the Lord said, if God calls something permissible and clean, you must not call it forbidden and dirty. Now that line sticks with Peter. He's like, Whoa, like I thought we were talking about food, but this sounds more prominent, like it has more of a depth meaning than what we're talking about right now. So what is this? Peter's mind was still racing about the vision when the voice of the Holy Spirit broke through his churning thoughts. Three men who are searching for you have been sent by me. So get up and go with them. Don't hesitate or argue. And I want to write, I really highlighted that last part because it spoke to me and I think it's important for us is that when God is starting to weed out the thistles in our lives and he's doing this spiritual, in-depth surgery that only he can do so he's not removing the good seed. He's just removing the things that he wants gone in his timing. He will say things like that absolutely challenge our understanding in the moment. He'll say, listen, I need you to do this or I need you to go here and we won't understand it and he won't absolutely oblige us by giving us the whole story to make us feel better because he's more concerned with our well-being than our comfort. But he will say, I need you to go. Don't hesitate. Don't argue. Or in my case, because this is the way I like to think of him speaking to me because I need it, shut up and go. I love you, but I need you to zip this and go with these, you know, because I need an idiot proof. And he does that. He opens one door. He says, that's it. Go. I know you don't know what's happening, but I just need you to go. Just trust and go. You won't understand until you get there. So don't wait. If God's prompting you to do something, do not wait for it to fully make sense before you leap. If it's God and he tells you to go, go. Or you will miss out on something that is so life-changing. You might have those thistles still defining your character because you never chose to follow him in his surgery and the removal of him in his time. And then he goes with these guys. And then he meets Cornelius. And this is what Peter says to him. He finally meets this guy and he's like, whoa, okay, this is starting to make sense now because I, I, I never would have gone to this guy had it been for the voice of the Lord speaking in my life. And I'll tell you why, because it comes up right here. Peter starts off with something that sounds so stupid and so blatantly obvious. He says, you know I'm a Jew. It's like, Thank you. Okay. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Caucasian and an African-Canadian guy are sitting in the same room. It's like the white guy saying, you know I'm white, right? Who starts off a conversation that way? Now, this is anointed by the Lord. I need you to know that I am white. Now, in my defense, actually, I did have a conversation like that one time. When I was, <laughs> my first pastoral vocation, being a youth pastor at a Chinese church, we had had weeks of email conversations back and forth. They get on the phone, and someone starts speaking Chinese to me. I'm like, hello? I thought it was like a telemarketer. And then, oh, they switch over to broken English. Oh, it's, it's Anna. I'm like, I'm right here. Like, and we start having this conversation back and forth. And they're talking about all these different things. I'm like, you know I'm white, right? Oh, we have to call you back. And they hung up the phone because they had no idea because someone had not done their research that I was not Chinese. And I'm like, I am not getting this job. And then they had another interview. And since I was walking in with that attitude, I had no reservations about what I was and was not going to say. 
I was not playing a game at that point. So I walked in and I just said it like it was. I wasn't nice about it. Like, what do you think was my? I think that's stupid and I'll tell you why. And then I got the job. <laughs> but those are seriously conversations that can happen. When you have to state the blatantly obvious, and Peter does it for a reason. Listen to what he says afterward. We Jews, and I've just established that I am a Jew, consider it a breach of divine law to associate, much less share hospitality with outsiders, which you clearly are. You are not one of us. I should not be here, nor would I have been here had it not been for God. But that's not where the story ends. But God, again, but God, has shown me something in recent days. I should no longer consider any human beneath me or unclean. It is clear to me now that God plays no favorites, that God accepts every person, whatever his or her culture or ethnic background. God welcomes all who revere and do right by him. It doesn't matter what your life has been. It doesn't matter what you're doing right now. It doesn't matter what brokenness is confining or defining you right in this moment. It doesn't matter what shameful things you have in your closet. It does not matter because God is for everyone. But somewhere along the line, it's been, it's been divided of the insiders, those saved by Christ, and everyone else, the outsiders. And Jesus says, I need you to humble yourself. Allow me to take that thistle out of your life, do a work in you, so you can see everyone is on the same team from the same Father who wants all of his kids together, not just some. And that really hit me. It finally made sense. Why does God choose us to do his work? Because if we're a part of his work, then he's continuously at work refining who I am, who we are, and who we engage with. And we get to understand more about who he is by how he's changing us to be like him and how I see people. No matter how stupid they are, I can still love them. No matter how hurtful and hateful they are, there's still something inside me that's beyond my ability that says they have value. It changes me. It absolutely has practical implications for everyone this side of eternity that we don't just become complacent or sit there and think we got it all figured out and wait for Jesus to come back or wait to die. He says there is so much every second of every moment offers an opportunity for you to become more than you are by me at work in you because you're my kids. You bear my image and my likeness. I love you. I want to do a work in you and I want that work to extend through you to other people. Stop trying to play God. Do not try and pull it out yourselves. Let God be God in their life, but be receptive to my prompting. And he'll use such silly things to get our attention. Peter was hungry. God says, oh, I've got an idea. Let me show you something about food. It had nothing to do with food. Nothing. And he absolutely opened Peter's eye and he removed that one thistle that had been ingrained into him since he was a wee boy going through all the education of the Old Testament that said, we are better than everyone else. You're an outsider. You're below me. And God says, no. No, no. When I said go and make disciples of all nations, I meant it, everyone. The drug dealers, the pimps, whoever it may be. And we've all got people in our lives that drive us freaking nuts, that need Jesus. And we might not be the ones to bring them because we're not going to go pulling thistles. We're not, that's not our motivation. But it's just even sometimes for our own benefit. How we see the world and everyone in it needs to be refined and sometimes continuously refined in my case. My heart gets hard. He's got to come and soften it. My heart gets hard. He's got to come and soften it. He removes the weeds. More grow up in its place. He comes back. He's still spraying the, the weed be gone. He's still you know, mowing the lawn and spraying all the stuff and trying to bring flowers out in my life that need to grow. And sometimes I'm fighting him by you know, whatever it may be. But he's always at work to say, I want to be God in your life so I can be God to everyone in this world and bring my kids back home because they're mine. All of them which brings value to everyone we come across, which makes us instruments of hope because we have had encounters with Christ and we want everyone else to. We don't want to shove religion down their throats. Religion doesn't save anybody. We're not going to worship the worship service or the building we worship in. We're not going to put the Bible on the throne of Jesus Christ either. We're going to say the scriptures lead to Jesus. Come, come see him. Yesterday at the wedding, I had several conversations with people. I talked to one guy... And his story was fascinating. 
And he was one of uh, the, the groom's closest friends. It was his best friend's dad who had been such a father figure to him his whole life. He was so excited to have him there. They sat at the family table. But this guy's story, he was a philosopher and he was seeking truth through different avenues and he, t- he tested everything. He said, do you know so-and-so who's actually associated with the Church of Christ out in Brad Creek? He said, I know the name. I probably know the face. Yeah, yeah. I tried his church for 10 years and it drove me nuts and I gave it up. And then I tried Buddhism and I learned some stuff and it kind of resonated but then it really left me unfulfilled. And I tried this. I was a part of the Church of Scientology for 10 years. He told me about his journey with that. He's like, they have a lot of interesting stuff actually that speaks more gospel truth than most churches do. But the end result left me dissatisfied. The more I studied, the more I searched, the more the Bible became real to me and I knew that Jesus is Lord. I just can't find a church that seems to believe the same way I do. I said, well, I hope you find it, and I really hope you have a good journey, my friend. But again, had someone come and tried to pull the weeds and the thistles because he's doing all these other avenues, but God is so much bigger than our concerns, our fears, our inadequacies. His journey ended up in the same place, Jesus. It wasn't because some great preacher came up and preached at him and said, you're going to hell if you don't get your, your act together, and shook him by the coattails it was Jesus just journeying with him it was amazing and he and I had these conversations but since I was a pastor he started to grill me and he's way smarter than I am because he wanted to see where I was are you on this level or how do you believe and he wasn't trying to like outsmart me he was trying to seriously just prod and poke and see what I was and I told him my my method I think that faith needs to be practical I approach the practicality of the scriptures in my faith. I, if there's nothing to be taken that absolutely will have impact on who I am and who we are, I'm not going to share it. And it has to be personal first. Every time I go through the scripture, it's something is speaking to me that I will try my best to relate to you and articulate. But some people just get up and they do a job. And that's when it becomes phony. And this world is getting so smart now and so desperate, it will no longer settle for phony surface level religion it needs Jesus it needs the church which scares me because Jesus says I chose you to be me in the world go your life might be the only Bible some people read your voice might be the only sermon some people hear your actions might be the only embrace of love of God some people ever have experienced up until this point go and be me to all people without reservation. If you've got problems, don't worry about it. I'm going to work on that with you all along the way. One thistle at a time. God, we thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you work with me, that you take time, that you just are so patient. God, that you you do this, this specific surgery day after day and sometimes, many times over, trying to refine who I am how I think, how I speak, how I see, how I act. Lord God, that you're at that work with all of us, Lord Jesus, that we may be your representatives in the world that needs to experience Jesus, not just hear about a faith, but experience Christ. So Lord, pour out your spirit. Continue to do that work, Lord. Let us be proper representatives. Bring us, Lord, opportunities that we could not manufacture or force ourselves with agendas, but allow us just to simply respond and react to situations you bring to us to to properly represent you and who we are. Lord, that it may have life-changing implications on all people around us and you, Lord, because you just simply show up at unexpected times, Lord, whether it's Melody serving above and beyond because she cares about people, whether it's having conversations or seeing people journeying and trying different faiths until they ultimately come to the conclusion that you reveal yourself and true spirituality is found in Jesus, not in religion, not even faith about Jesus, but in Jesus himself. So come, Show, demonstrate, sweep over, whatever it takes, whatever it may be, Lord. Give us patience with each other when we screw up and fall down. Lord, and give us the discernment and wisdom to not try and be you in other people's lives as well. Let us stop trying to be the farmer. Let us be the obedient farmhands who simply support the farmer and go and do his work in his field at his time. In Jesus' name, amen.